Hi and welcome back to a new video, also follow-up video regarding 11900K deleting and direct die cooling. Originally I already promised this in the 11900K launch video, but we didn't have the time to finish direct die after deleting. Now we will just go straight for the direct die attempt. Again, a lot of people asked in the launch video, why would you even do this? The reason is pretty simple, because right now we have the chip, we have liquid metal, we have the IHS, then again we have thermal paste and then we have our cooler sitting on top. And ideally we want to get rid of all those additional layers. We want to have the chip, thermal paste, cooler. That should achieve the best temperatures in theory possible. But it's always a little bit tricky. I mean we already managed to successfully pass the deleting part but we still have to kind of master the direct die mounting part which can be tricky just regarding like the mounting pressure and getting proper contact and all of that. But let's just go ahead and see if we can make it. This video is supported by our long-term partner Hetzner. Hetzner has been offering products and infrastructure for private and business clients since 1997. With their own data centers in Germany and Finland and in-house rack design and production, Hetzner can offer swift individual solutions. Using the server auction feature, you can configure your own dedicated root server and when the moment is right, snap up your offer. There is no minimum runtime or minimum contract duration and you can rent the server immediately. Unlimited traffic and gigabit connection are also included. Hetzner also focuses on ecological use of their hardware and reuses hardware as often as possible. Find out more in the link below. So that was the last state and the previous state. You can see the lid is still on there. The only difference between this and stock is that underneath we don't have the solder team anymore we have liquid metal sitting underneath and we used this Corsair block for our testing. Previous generations were even more difficult for direct die cooling because you can see those like plastic parts surrounding the sockets right here and for especially like 6700K, 7700K, those kind of generations, they had such a thin PCB and a very thin chip that if you would have the chip in the center and press it down with the cooler, the cooler would make contact with the edges and not with the chip itself, which would direct, which would make direct die almost impossible. Just removed the lid from the CPU. You can see the liquid metal amount was pretty much perfect. It only squeezed out a tiny amount on the left and on the right, but on the bottom, for example, nothing touched those caps. Even though we kind of protected them, still it's good that, yeah, not too much liquid metal was applied. All right, gonna clean the CPU quickly. We know from the previous video that the PCB height is about 1.2 millimeter. And now I measured those tiny caps on the side, just on the other side right here. And we can measure about 1.55 millimeter if we take out the CPU. All right, so that's why we know that those parts right here on the side, those tiny SMD caps, they should have a height of about 0.35, 0.3 millimeters, something in that direction, which is a good thing because we know that the chip in the center has about 0.6 millimeter height. We also measured that in a previous video. That means that if we put the CPU cooler on top, it won't directly touch those parts, but we're still trying to cover them because you know the PCB will bend by a certain degree, not much, but it will bend. And there's always a risk involved that those parts right here could touch the cooler from underneath. That is something we absolutely want to avoid, but we have enough space on top to somehow cover those parts and therefore prevent short circuits. If you follow my weekly update video, you might have also seen those stencils, those cutouts. We laser cut them out of 0.5 millimeter thick uh, plastic foil and those should be to protect our CPU. Previously to this generation, we always made those direct die frames. This one was specially made for the 10900K, but we had the same kind of thing for the 9900K as well. It was much simpler because there were no SMD parts on the side, but we also needed the additional mounting pressure from the frame to make sure that the PCB is not bending. But for this generation, because the PCB is a little bit thicker and also the die is thicker, it gives us much more stability. I hope that we don't even need a frame, that just this tiny stencil would already help. Because essentially we want to cover the whole CPU like this, so our CPU cooling block would press from the top. Otherwise, if we don't have an even pressure from the top, it's very likely that some parts on the corner, like the PCB would bend on this area right here or the area right here in the front. This could lead the memory to be falsely detected or not detected and, and cause boot issues. 
And as you can see, the foil indeed has a thickness of 0.5 millimeters. But you can see measured on a side where the laser cutter did its work, you can see it's a little bit thicker. It's because some parts of the edge are always melting due to the laser cutting process. And in this area, for example, we have about 0.64 millimeter that would result in the CPU cooler not perfectly touching the center of the die. So we kind of have to grind the foil a little bit down and check that it's everywhere 0.5 millimeters. That actually looks quite nice. The next step is taping the CPU into the socket using some Captain tape just for insulation because that's also like heat resistant and very thin. It will not only protect those tiny parts, but it should also help to keep the CPU in the socket if we remove the cooler. It really looks good. 1.72 millimeters measured from the bottom of the PCB to the top of the plastic part. And measured from the bottom of the PCB to the top part of the die, we have 1.775 millimeters. So that means we have a height difference between the die and the plastic part of 0.05 millimeters. That is absolutely perfect. I have to admit, I'm quite happy with the result. It might look a little bit nasty right here and here on the bottom. That's mainly because of this tiny nose here on the bottom. You cannot perfectly align it on the side, but that doesn't matter as long as right on top. Yeah, this feels very, very smooth. All right, liquid metal application and then moment of truth. Conductor node is applied on the CPU die and also on the bottom of the Corsair cooling block. Yeah, can't wait to see the results. Due to the fact that we're not using an IHS right now, the cooler is sitting a little bit lower. That's why we also have to adjust the mounting kit a bit and just add an additional washer on top. Okay, moment of truth. I will not attach the water cooling for now just to see if the CPU is detected correctly or if we will encounter any issues. Well, I mean, the board is running, but there is no debug code. No code at all. That's interesting. Hmm. Well, at least according to this LED, it's a CPU detection error. All right, I mean, you can directly see that the mounting is touching the cap right here, and the caps on this side, and also the caps on the back, which is not directly an issue. I mean, it's not causing any kind of shorts or whatever, but that is probably limiting our mounting pressure a bit, which means that we will either have to modify the mounting plate right here or go for a different cooling block which would kind of suck because then we would have to repeat the previous testing because we would have different temperature results. All right, new day. Let's see if the EK block can manage to do the direct die. At least the mounting mechanism looks a bit more promising. I already changed backplate and those standoffs. The only thing which could be an issue is that this might be too high and that I have to replace the screws, but we will see that in a second. All right, let's check if this works. At least the block is quite a bit smaller. You can see it's not colliding with the caps here, here, and also on the back. All right, let's check. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah, I'm very happy right now because it's running. Yeah, memory detection worked. No issues whatsoever. 3600 C17, that's a typical memory configuration, I would say. Also, temperatures look quite good and idle. All right, let's check how the dimension looks like. First impression looks very promising. At least it looks similar to the lidding. It doesn't look worse, which means that we have good contact between the cooling block and the die. Just judging the temperatures, but it's always, yeah, it's not that easy to get a correct impression, especially because we changed the cooling block, which means that I will have to repeat the entire previous testing with the, just the lidding. I will have to repeat that with the EK block to get sufficient data, but at least direct die is working this way. That's great. I just finished evaluating our data from the leading versus direct die, also comparing the XC7 versus the EK velocity because we swept the CPU block. Luckily, just judging the two lines of the XC7 versus the EK velocity, those lines are very close together and typically they are within one degree Celsius, which is a good sign. I mean, performance seems to be very close together with those CPU blocks, which means that we can somehow still compare it to our previous measurement. But you will also notice that if you compare it from the leading versus direct die, that direct die was actually worse than before. And that could be caused by numerous of different factors. First of all, it could be due to our like washer, stencil, whatever, that this could be in the way that we don't have the perfect mounting contact, the perfect mounting pressure, 
or it could also be related to the CPU block itself because those CPU blocks, they are not meant and not designed to work direct die. They usually need a heat spreader to work perfectly to spread the heat across the CPU block and don't have like this very tiny heat source directly underneath the cooling block because keep in mind, the minimum layer thickness on the bottom of such a CPU water block is very, very thin. They are made to work typically with a heat spreader, which could be an explanation. But I will now test if it also works without the shim, without the stencil, just to see if it improves the mounting pressure and also to see if this is even necessary or if you want to do direct dye, that you just can do it without. And the CPU is already ready to go. You can see the shim is missing this time. I still protected everything with the captain tape. First of all, to protect those tiny SMDs on the left and on the right, to prevent them from having contact directly with the cooler to cause any kind of short circuits. This is prevented this way. And also it works kind of like a direct dye frame because the tape will kind of help the CPU back down in the socket in case you want to remove your CPU cooler. But keep in mind that this probably only works in like very short term because if you leave this on for like one or two years, then it's very likely that the liquid metal kind of sticks or bonds the CPU to the cooler. Well, at least it will stick much more than it will now. CPU cooler is in place. If you want to repeat this at home, which is something I wouldn't really recommend, but if you're doing it anyway, and if you don't use any kind of frame or like stencil the way we did it before, keep in mind that there is always a certain risk involved cracking your die and especially mounting the water block. You have to be extremely careful, always yeah, mount those two first, then these always like in very small increments and tiny steps to apply even pressure to prevent your block from kind of tilting and breaking the die. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The initial test kind of looks promising at least. Yeah, not sure why the score looks a little bit low, but that should still be fine. Temperatures were kind of in line. That looks okay. All right, I will perform the Prime95 testing and then we will be back. And also in this case with direct dye without a shim protecting the dye around it, the results were exactly the same. I could not find any kind of significant difference between the direct dye testing we did before and the second attempt we did without the shim. The cool thing is that it also works without a shim. It seems to be no issue at all. As I said before in a previous or in the first video regarding 11900K, the PCB got thicker, the dye is much larger, which somehow probably prevents the CPU from bending. What we had, especially with like 8700K or like 6700K where the die was much smaller and the PCB was very thin. But in this case, direct die seems to work at least mechanically, but I couldn't find any kind of temperature benefit over normal deleting. And also keeping in mind that when I was using normal uh, deleted CPU, where I replaced the solder tim with conductor not liquid metal, I was still using conventional thermal paste on top cryonaut extreme. But you could still replace that with liquid metal if you wanted to and then gain another like, I don't know, half a degree or one degree Celsius. All right. Otherwise, direct dye seems to be not worth it, at least for my current testing on 11900K, while the lidding definitely helped improve the temperatures. Thanks for tuning in. See you next time. Bye bye.